Thanks very much, Ken. I'm glad to see all of you here. As Ken said, time's tight, so I have a lot of slides, and I'm going to skip a lot of them. Um, the presentation that I'm going to make summarizes the changes in global regulation, whether they will increase or not stability is an opinion of mine. Then I'm going to make some recommendations. And then if we have time, I hope I will squeeze in a slide on the impact of all this on the bank and the fund. Summary. I think the regulations are going to be too late before their implementation. They're too little, and enforcement of them is going to be a big issue. Okay, so I'm going to start by skipping a couple of slides and talk about the role of the IMF and the World Bank before the crisis, during the crisis, and right now. <clears throat> Surveillance by the IMF before the 2008 crisis was not good. There were few clear warnings about the risks and vulnerabilities associated with the impending crisis before its outbreak. The banner message was one of continued optimism. That's from the IMF's own independent evaluation office. In 2008 crisis, as we heard yesterday, the bank and the IMF provided a lot of resources. Uh, that included 285 billion new special drawing rights. However, the lending of the bank and the IMF limited their future lending capacity. In the current crisis, the Eurozone crisis, as I will call it, the IMF's large involvement, co-funded with major shareholders, in my opinion, has complicated IMF independence and stressed IMF financial and staff resources. Okay. The new post-crisis regulations had only a minimal developing country, IMF, and bank input. Probably none by the developing countries. Some advisory role by the IMF, but not very much. So what's going to happen is that the IMF and bank will push for adoption of the new rules in the financial sector assessments and the financial sector stability assessment is now part of Article 4 surveillance. So, there will continue to be support for crisis response, but this all is going to be limited, in my opinion, by staff at, and funds at the IMF and the World Bank. Okay, what's new? Quick summary of the recommendations. Capital in Basel III. <clears throat> Basel II plus, or maybe even plus plus. There's going to be more capital, a lot more capital. It's going to be better capital, and the larger banks are going to have to pay even more capital, have even more capital reserves. There also is an addition of a 3% leverage requirement, or limit, minimum, and liquidity requirements based on the bank's own uh, models of how much liquidity they're going to need. The toxic derivatives, toxic assets, which were a problem uh, in the crisis, attempts to solve that are going to be having trading of plain vanilla, simple derivatives, transparently in exchanges. And the exchanges will be counterparties on each side of the trade. So they will be sold the derivative, and then they will sell it to the new buyer. So there are counterparties on both sides. The banks will require capital against counterparting risks. And there are some restrictions on exposures and uh, types of assets that will be traded. Finally, there are going to be limits on proprietary trading, that is using your own capital, in the US and the UK. Will these changes increase stability? They address the 2008 crisis causes, but I have to say, in my opinion, the outcome is uncertain. More capital should reduce risky bank behavior and reduce the risks to depositors and deposit insurers. 
less heads I win, tails you lose behavior. Derivative risks should decline. Sorry, I'm whoop, 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 already lost it. Derivative risks should decline with more transparency and more capital. The larger capital for big banks should slow their growth. Now you'll notice it's in italics and capitalized should. The bottom line is how will insiders react to all this? And in fact, will banks' holdings of off-market derivatives and related capital rise or not? There are at least three issues with the new regulatory architecture itself. Late in full implementation. Basel III will only be fully implemented with the higher, better capital and the leverage rules by 2018-19. That's a few years off. A lot can happen in that time. This will be further delayed by a Eurozone crisis. UK law is only in Parliament. US is still writing regulations for its law, and these are being delayed by banks' legal action over cost-benefit issues. All regulation in the US is subject to a cost-benefit rule, even though there was, uh, in the law, exempted this from the cost-benefit rule, the banks are still bringing legal action. In this context, what's going to be appropriate for the IMF and the bank? This is a hard thing to do. The dialogue with the countries is going to be about how far along each country is relative to a moving target, which is going to gradually be coming into being by 2018, 19. So I think there's a problem with the lateness of the full implementation. Second, too little. <clears throat> this refers, in my opinion, mostly to the industrial countries. The risk weights for capital calculations are not much changed. After what's been going on in the Eurozone, do we still think that a zero risk weight for government debt is appropriate? I have my doubts about that one. Sometimes the investment grade government debt turns into not so investment grade very quickly, at least in the market's viewpoint. How is the, how are the risk weighted capital calculated? <clears throat> this is now basically for the large banks, proprietary models that they have. Each one has their own model. There are thousands of risk buckets to determine the risk. A study by the UK FSA on a number of companies, and then they went to the banks to see how they rated the risk on each of those companies, is interesting in that it shows that they all rate these companies differently so that the actual risk weighted capital among the large banks is not comparable because they are assigning different risks to the same companies. Third, this is a more sophisticated thing, but generally people are thinking now the risk weight should be based on the expected loss, not the value at risk, which eliminates the out of 5% of the distribution. Well, we've seen that's kind of a problem. So there should probably be more capital for this kind of risk. My own opinion is the leverage at 3% is low. It also depends on the balance sheet accounting, particularly the off-balance sheet, as we know from the Lehman case. Lots of stuff was off-balance sheet. Liquidity issues. The 30 largest banks are 60% market funded. Anybody remember something called Northern Rock in the UK and the lines in front? Actually, there were some lines, but the real problem was they couldn't get their market funding. So I'm not sure the liquidity issue is being handled. 
Finally, the derivatives are a big mess in my opinion. The capital calculations are a little shaky. How are you going to exactly do this or should do this? Can the holdings of these derivatives be liquidated quickly? Well, Lehman showed that couldn't be true. And now we have the problem just recently of J.P. Morgan. They could not get rid of their hedging of their hedging of a risk that they had taken. And that's why they've lost $5 billion. A final question is, as I mentioned, in the plain vanilla trading, counterparties will be the exchange. Okay, who's backing up the exchange? Will the exchange have enough capital to handle this? So, my view is this stuff is fine, but too little. <clears throat> Basic problem. Can supervision enforce these new regulations promptly? What's new in supervision is macroprudential supervision. That's a good idea. I think that's very good. It just needs more linkage to policy. But we now have the ECB, the European Central Bank, becoming the center of EU supervision. This is going to require integration with the national supervisors. And how is the IMF going to deal with the ECB? Then there's the problems in supervision with big banks and in supervision itself. As I mentioned, there's an enormous complexity in the big banks. Some people think that even the managers don't know what's going on in the big banks. I, I sort of lean to that. And the second, there's a big problem with the legal issues in enforcing prompt corrective action. Then we move to the question of slowness of supervisors to act. Too few supervisors, political pressures, threats of legal and even physical attacks on the supervisors. Then there's the whole regulatory capture by the big banks that we were discussing last night at the dinner table. And then there's the attitudes toward regulation. In case anyone hasn't noticed, the Republican Party said, let's get back to no regulation. What do the supervisors do in that case if the Republicans win? OK. I'm going to skip the non-industrial countries. Oops, I'm going backwards here. Recommendations. More emphasis on too big to fail. There's a lot of things listed here that you can do. Higher deposit insurance, et cetera. Rely more on the leverage and liquidity requirements, less on the risk-weighted capital, which is not really comparable between banks. Consider better ways to impose losses on lenders to bad banks before a crisis. That is to say the big lenders, because they're the really people who fund these banks. It isn't capital, it's the lenders. As I said, a lot of market uh, dependence. <clears throat> Hold bank executives responsible for fraud. This is now something that they, is not the case in the US. The bank is responsible, but the managers cannot be sued. Improve the incentives and rules for better, faster supervision and intervention, particularly prompt corrective action. And be ready to act in a concerted, uh, ad hoc way in crises. One minute? One minute. OK, bank and fund. Consider how to manage supervalence and involvement with the large stockholders in the two institutions and the ECB. This is particularly an issue for the IMF. I honestly think the IMF is in over their head uh, dealing with these uh, EU countries. It just, they can't enforce anything. The smaller countries, the, even the middle income countries, but not the, not the Eurozone. Reconsider the standard recommendation that we always used to make, foreign banks will automatically solve the problems. Consider ways to deal with foreign banks, including ad hoc arrangements such as the Vienna Initiative, which tried to keep the money in the Eastern European countries. Reconsider how you do FSAPs. Should we spend so much time on stress testing? 
not clear what you're doing with that now, particularly, as I mentioned, with the different bank models and different ratings. Improve macro prudential supervision. I didn't mention this before, but developing countries seem to feel they too are getting large banks, so they need help in how to deal with them and increase competition. With IMF and bank lending resources limited, should they switch to more knowledge-based activities? And will the staff competent to do this, or do they need some changes? Thank you very much. <laughs>